you have a really strong market helping to propel your earnings. How long can that last? Yeah, it's an extremely strong market, uh, and we're probably seeing uh, a tightness that we haven't experienced since, uh, I would say, around 1987. Uh, and it's a combination of a lot of elements. You have short-term elements that you're referring to, power shortages, uh, supply chain uh, issues, strong rebound of demand after COVID. But we also have some long-term elements, uh, like, for example, uh, automotive uh, requiring more aluminium into battery electrical vehicles. Uh, you're seeing uh, the green transition uh, requiring more aluminium uh, to feed new windmills, etc. So the, the question is uh, really, are the longer-term elements strong enough to balance out the short-term elements that could disappear? And I have no good answer to that. Uh, but the absolute strength of the market uh, looks better than it did a year ago, also on a long-term basis. Well, of course, it's hard to predict some of those long-term elements. But when it comes to the short-term things like the supply chain crunches, higher metal prices, do you have any readout or any predictions for how long those short-term elements, as you put it, will last? Well, if you start, for example, with the, the chip shortage um, that uh, we, we have experienced uh, in our industry, which is now also starting to play a bit uh, in, in on our side, then the expectation were that these would be resolved during the summer of this year. Now people are, are talking more about the second half uh, next year. Um, and on other areas also, for example, uh, the energy side, it depends a lot on the weather conditions. Uh, part of what we're seeing uh, is driven by absolute long-term lower production levels of fossil fuels. Other things are driven by, for example, less rain in China compared to what they expected or what is the normal. If you have good hydrological seasons, you can see some of these elements improving, whereas other could be a bit more longer term in nature. Well, things, for example, like in China, ingredients like silicone, magnesium, ones that are very crucial for your business in order to produce some of these uh, specialized aluminum parts. Uh, your CEO speaking earlier today said that uh, he doesn't foresee that recovering so, or the, that you have enough cover for that rather until early 2022. Um, what happens after that period if indeed the market has not recovered, if China isn't able to step up some of their output? Do you have to look into alternative markets? Well, that's a good question. If you start with magnesium, for example, 85% of the world's magnesium production sits in China. So there are limited other uh, alternatives. If there are other alternatives, I'm quite sure that they are looking at the possibility uh, for getting this out to market, given the extreme prices we're seeing now. We have strong relationships uh, with uh, the, the suppliers uh, in, in China. And, and we, we see that there are developments, discussions uh, about how to get this back. But if this does not uh, come back, then basically uh, for uh, value-add products, you would, as a first instance, uh, start producing more standard products instead, which doesn't uh, require uh, aluminium. But uh, this is not a longer-term sustainable uh, level. So then if China stops exporting, you would need to trigger production at other places. Hmm. And what does the conversation look like with your customers when it comes to some of these contracts? Obviously, demand is really high, but prices are high as well, especially with groups like the automotive groups. What have those conversations looked like? <clears throat> well, everyone uh, is asking the same question that you are asking me now. Uh, what uh, insight do we have? Uh, what can we guarantee? Uh, and we cannot guarantee more than uh, we are working on it. Uh, and we're also needing to pass uh, some of these uh, costs uh, on to customers. So there are many challenging discussions uh, in a period uh, where there is tightness across uh, the value chain. But they understand that it's not a company-specific issue. This impacts all aluminium producers, and it also impacts many other industries which require more magnesium uh, than, than aluminium. So everyone's working uh, together across unions and organizations, etc., to try and make it very clear that this situation uh, is not sustainable in the longer term uh, for uh, European uh, and global industries. Paul, before I want to let you before I let you go, I also want to ask you about Norsk Hydro becoming a net buyer of spot electricity. Um, how difficult has this been considering buying spot electricity in these markets? Hasn't exactly been a cheap venture to try to do. No, no, um, we we did buy uh, back uh, or buy electricity in the the third quarter. On a whole year level, uh, we are long power uh, in most uh, scenarios. But you might have quarters where we go a bit uh, short because we try and produce uh, electricity when prices are higher, which is typically the winter quarter. 
This doesn't create any large issues for us. Uh, we, we have a bit lower earnings uh, due to that uh, effect in energy. But on the other side, energy price differentials in Norway have been really high uh, this quarter, which more than compensates this effect and actually uh, results in an energy uh, result, which is uh, not too bad uh, for a third quarter. Paul, I'm afraid we're going to have to leave it there. Thanks so much for joining us this morning. That's Paul Kildemo, CFO of Norsk Hydro.